No, too late. No, not taking them. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we're live cool. again. So welcome back to the Night Hacking streaming directly from Java Land, day two. And now we have a new guest, Ray Zhang. Hello, hi. Thanks yeah, for nice having me here. Yeah, it's great <laughs> that, you, uh, that you're here. And you want to show us something called gRPC. So what is that? So gRPC is a uh, RPC framework that was open sourced by Google and uh, Square, actually, together. Oh, okay. And uh, gRPC is a general uh, use uh, remote procedural code framework. Yeah. Uh, and the G in gRPC doesn't stand for Google, right? It's just uh, it's <laughs> actually a recursive acronym. And what it is is that it allows you to write uh, your uh, service contracts in an IDL, in an interface definition language, uh -huh. and then it can actually generate uh, the stops for the server oh, and okay. also the stops for the client, and uh, it generates everything with ty type safety, and it can generate uh, for multiple languages, um, like seven or eight of them, actually. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. but it also defines the binary protocol, the actual. So it's not just uh, like right. service definition, like JMS or something, but it really has the binary protocol defined that yeah. then gets generated. Right, yeah. So the, the, the protocol behind the scenes is actually uh, based on the... Um, the, for the transport layer, it uses HTTP2. Uh -huh. uh, so rather than having its own TCP socket protocol, it just uses HTTP2 and taking advantage of the HTTP2 uh, protocol, such as uh, streaming. That's one of the biggest things uh, in HTTP2. Yes. And for this RPC framework, you can also uh, write streaming services, both uh, client to server, server to client, and mm -hmm. also bidirectional. Uh, and uh, that really fits with some of the reactive uh, programming style that uh, people are looking into today as well. Uh, and also for the binary level uh, pack, uh, packages, uh, they're using proto buffer. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the objects are going to be marshaled into proto buffer three binaries that will be then sent through the wire. Yeah, so okay. it's very efficient. Yeah. Well, that sounds really promising. So yeah. can you give a, a short example, like wha example for a um, basic API, for uh, for instance, that shows sure. how to use it? Sure. Yeah. So the first thing that we needed to do is uh, defining the IDL. Uh, or the interface definition language. Now, in my session, I usually uh, code this up uh, and uh, take uh, the audience through uh, line by line, basically. But I'm going to give a very quick overview here. Uh, first of all, in this uh, definition language, we need to set the syntax to proto3 because we're using proto buffer3 uh, syntax here. If you don't specify it, it's going to mistakenly uh, okay. potentially use an older version. That sounds, uh, looks like yeah. an interesting syntax here. It's like Yeah, it looks almost like Java. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, because you can specify the package, right? right? You can also specify, Enums, you can create an enumeration. Right. And, but then the, the way that you define the message payload is by uh, you know, defining the, um, the type of the field, the name of the field. Yep. And most importantly, uh, because in protobuf, we don't send the name of the field uh, like in JSON right, uh, for every single uh, uh, message that we're trying to send. Right. And that will actually, if you do it that way, like JSON, right, you will actually use up a lot of bandwidth just to right. send the exactly. field names. Uh, so in protobuf 3, uh, in protobuf in general, uh, we send the binary encoding of that. But because we don't know how you want to encode this, um, you know, we cannot auto-generate this. So you actually have to code this out manually. You have to specify okay. it. So in this case, uh, for every field that I define, I have to say, OK, this is going to use the 1 as the representation in the binary encoding. And the next field needs to use 2, uh, and so on and so forth. And you can see here, we can also uh, uh, have the construct for type safe uh, maps, maps for key yeah. and values. Yeah, that is that is very interesting. Yeah, and I mean it makes sense to uh, to have the fixed um, the fixed orderings because it's a binary protocol anyway, right? So it right. doesn't have to be humanly readable. Right. But so you just can't say, okay, please save as much space as possible. Right. And yeah, pretty yeah. much. So yeah, interesting. an audience actually asks, can we not auto order this? Um, right. So rather than saying one, two, three, four, five, can we just determine it based on the position of on the, the parameters? Order, yeah. yeah. or the attribute. But the problem with that is, well, what if you change your payload? What if uh, what if you deleted something uh, or you right, added a field? The yeah, it's the same the with the enums, right? And the yeah. enum ordinal. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> same old story. Exactly. And but but then the beauty of this is that you, if you ever needed to add a new field, you can just add uh, I don't know uh, 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 location, right? You can do six. And if you ever wanted to say breaking down the name into two fields, you can say first name. Oh, sorry, first name is equal to seven, for example. Right, and then the last name is equal to eight, and then for the name field, you can simply just remove that, and to prevent right. somebody to accidentally using a field that you already deleted, yes. you can reserve 
the field and say reserve oh, one, okay. That's right? Good. So, or I, I think I'm using the wrong syntax here. I reserved mm -hmm. one. So in the future, uh, you can put something in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so in this case, you don't want one to be used at all. Uh, so you can just reserve it so nobody else can ac accidentally use it okay. anymore. Yeah. Yeah, that's r uh, really interesting. Okay, have you have a short? Do you have a short example of how this is then used through the uh, through code? Uh, yeah, sure. So once you define the payload, you have to define the service. Uh -huh. So this is the service contract. So you have the method, and then you have the request and the response. Uh, and in the code, uh, here's the server server code, right? So first of all, you need to implement the service, and we generate all the service I stop. So in this case, all you need to do is to extend a, a base implementation and then override the method implementation. And here is oh the good. request that's, um, that you're going to be receiving from the client. And to give back the data to the client from the server, well, usually usually we, we write uh, a program like this, right? Request, greeting, oh, sorry. We say we, we put the response, response in the return yeah. value, right? Usually right. We, we do it this way. Uh, but but you, as you can see, the, uh, the stop here is a little bit different. Well, that is because this style that we're accustomed to is actually blocking. Right. right? And so we don't want that. Yeah, we don't want that. Um, especially not on the server. So on the server side for gRPC for Java, everything is implemented with async in mind. Yes. And it is up to the client to determine whether you want to block or not. Yes. Right? So, so here, uh, you can get a request, and then you use the observer to send, uh, as a callback, to send the data back. Uh, and if, I, if you open up the code, uh, response observer, you can see that uh, it's oh got yeah. unnext, unarrow, and uncompleted. And if you look, look closely and compare this with the observables or uh, right in Rx Java, it's uh, pretty much very, very Rx similar. Rx Java or service and events, what we are doing in for Jax it yeah. looks pretty much the same pretty the API. So right? then, yeah, makes sense. Yep. Totally makes sense. Cool. So once you uh, send the data back, you have to close the stream, mm -hmm. and that's it. That, that completes the call. Uh, and from the client side, it's pretty simple and straightforward too. As you can see, there's not so many lines of code, uh, and everything's type safe. So I can actually write this whole thing in yes. a couple of minutes if I wanted right, to. Right. Uh, but on the client side, uh, w rather than opening up a TCP connection yourself or uh, managing the HTTP connection yourself, uh, we abstract everything away in a concept called a channel. channel. Right. So we can build a channel. Uh, you can specify where you want to connect to. Uh, whether you need to use any security like SSL. Uh, in dev, I just use uh, plain text because uh, it's much, much easier. Um, and once you have the channel, you can then invoke the stop by creating the channel. Now, the stop here is uh, interesting, too. So if I say new stop, uh, here you can also see that we have, you can actually create oh, yeah. three different stops, right? So again, it's up to the client whether they want How to block to or not. It, yes, makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, so just one question on the on the plain text. So yeah. it's it's not really plain text, right? It's just not encrypted since it's binary. Or that is so true. Yeah, I never <laughs> thought about that. Yeah, because uh, everything behind the scenes, even HTTP two, is binary. Right. So in this case, yeah, it's, you it's can It's plain, but it's not <laughs> like plain text. <laughs> it should it should just be said. Uh, it should be called uh, use insecure, right? right. I think that may make right. sense, right? No, that's a good feedback. Yeah, I never <laughs> even thought about it. There you go. Yeah. So so once you open this uh, plain text connection. <laughs> over a binary protocol, uh, then you can uh, use the stop, and you know, just then you can just call yeah. it, and that's it. Yeah, Done. Really great. Yeah, yeah. Um, can we have a short look at the hello request at the generated Java class? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. So let me see if I got this uh, hello request. So you may not like what it, what it looks like because uh, <laughs> when you say the request uh, hello request, it's not okay, actually so a POJO that you can construct from new because we uh, use the builder. A pattern uh, yeah. almost extensively yeah. in gRPC. So all of these things are actually immutable. So for you to construct a new request, you have to call the builder. I mean, uh, it makes sense, right? So it, this is kind of like the idea from, from Lombok, right? So if you create uh, yeah. like a Lombok POJO annotated with a lot of things that you want to create a builder pattern that you want to yeah. make it a value class and so on and so forth, a exactly. value object. So I mean, it totally makes sense. But what I'm interested in is are there any issues where you say um, that specifically if you call Java to C or something that, right. it, that the types don't match? For oh, example, gotcha. for integers, for unsigned ints, and so on and so forth. So gotcha. are there any, how, how, do you com how do you convert that reliably? Um, so because you specify the type uh, in protobuf here, 
So no matter which language you're using, uh, you will get these, these types, right? And they uh -huh. will uh, be typed uh, to the corresponding languages. So if you want to use unsigned int, for example, well, if the generated stop doesn't generate it for you, then you actually have to potentially do the conversion yourself. Yeah, yeah. So everything here is pretty much uh, predetermined. So you don't really run into the issue of, uh, say, type is match, right? Because the typing here is well-defined in yeah. proto buffer already. And the mapping to the target language is also well De defined. Depends on the language, yeah. Right, exactly. So, so there's really no uh, no trouble there. Uh, so we can bind to C, um, like uh, Node. If you want to use Node, Go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and there are like uh, uh, even .NET. Yeah, yeah. Sure. So I mean, yeah. why not? Yeah. And if you want to yeah. have more complex objects, then you just have to define all the way down to the primitives, right? Exactly, exactly. So, oh, that's a great uh, uh, question, actually. So. Because we have the concept of a package, and we also, uh, you can actually put proto um, messages and definitions mm -hmm. in different proto buffer files. Uh, just like Java, where you can import other classes uh, in proto buff, you can import another file. And once oh, okay. you import the file, you can then use uh, yeah. the, um, the package or the, the messages defined in that file. So in this case, uh, we actually define quite a few uh, additional types uh -huh. in a separate file. So you can import, in this case, a timestamp proto, okay. and then I can import the timestamp type. And if you predefined, like, yeah. Yeah, like the predefined JDK types. Exactly. Uh, like timestamp, instant, and. Exactly, that's, that's exactly. Really good. That's good. Yeah. Good. Um, and also, we have something called uh, annotation, which is kind of like, huh, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> so we don't do something like that, no. Um, so with annotations, you can actually add additional uh, information uh, to your service. So for example, you can add annotation on how would you like to export this as a JSON ser uh, RESTful service? Oh, so okay. even though we're defining all the, um, uh, the messages and the services here, and we know it's going to be converted into proto buffer, uh, but we can also annotate like how does this actually map to a service URL if oh, you okay, were to okay. do this with JSON and REST. Right. And then you can use a gRPC gateway to uh, basically convert this uh, proto file into a RESTful service. Mm -hmm. And we'll generate all the code for you. Oh wow! As well, that's, that's yeah, that's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. Then yeah, 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 yeah. So we we have done this actually in the past uh, in one of my project uh -huh. where uh, we defined a uh, a proto buffer service and we wanted to expose it to the browsers and because the browsers cannot talk with gRPC, mm -hmm. so we had to expose the RESTful service and we just added the annotation here, okay. and um, yeah, and then we generated the. Uh, the actual service that serves that converts from REST to gRPC, yeah. and we deploy that, and we're pretty much done. Wow! Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one last general question on, on sure. that uh, that protocol. I mean, you are probably using quite a lot at uh, or uh, at Google, right? And generally, how d do you see it that it's um, somewhat accepted out in the field? Like, because it's a binary protocol and it's right. pretty predefined how everything has to look like right that people actually use it for a somewhat communication maybe in microservices and yeah. so on and so forth yeah yeah actually I have heard uh, a lot of use cases from different companies uh, but uh, the ones that's uh, actually quite out there that's uh, very public so for example uh, even between um, in, in Google Cloud Platform uh, to get high performance um, um, uh, basically communication with our services, yeah. uh, we actually provide both the RESTful interface and also the gRPC interface. Oh, okay, great. Right? So for example, for uh, PubSub, for our messaging system, mm -hmm. REST could just be too slow for yeah. some people, and they just want to use gRPC straight sure. out. If uh, they support it, why not? Yeah, exactly. And also that, um, I don't know if anyone here heard about Kubernetes. So yeah. that's our container orchestration tool. And in the past, Kubernetes used the REST for their internal communication. Mm -hmm but they couldn't scale beyond, say, 1,000 nodes. Oh, okay. So they actually scaled to 2,000 nodes and by actually shifting everything to gRPC. Uh, oh even really? the backing store of HD was using gRPC uh -huh. as well, and that's how they can actually scale these things out. And I just got the notice that the 1.6 was released yesterday, and now okay. they can do uh, 5,000 nodes. Oh, okay, uh, they great. scale out to 5,000 nodes, yeah. Wow. If you go to the gRPC website, you can actually find a bunch of uh, uh, other users that's listed in there, uh, mm -hmm. and there are quite a few. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. And that's really interesting also to see the, like, the limitations of the HTTP, the yeah. normal plain, plain text communication. <laughs> That this has some <laughs> some bottlenecks, <laughs> some implications on your service communication. Yeah, which which gets a little weird if you think about it, right? Because uh, we we came so far 
um, from moving from a traditional RPC world to an yes. interoperable XML world with SOAP, and now to an interoperable REST world. But then yeah. the, the, the one of the reasons for that shift is because SOAP was too slow, right? And there was no yeah. other alternative. And now, again, um, we're realizing that, wait a second, text-based is just going to be slow regardless. Right. So we just went straight to right. binary. Yeah. yeah. Like <laughs> wow. Yeah, really uh, interesting. Okay. Thanks a lot for sharing. Is yeah. there any last thing you want to um, tell the live audience from, from the Javaland conference? Uh, yeah, I mean, such a great conference. Uh, if you have not been here before, I would highly, highly recommend it. Uh, they have the conference in a theme park. So <laughs> I mean, imagine <laughs> it, that. <laughs> you can really beat that. And I uh, had a lot of fun uh, in the theme park with the uh, roller coasters yesterday, too. So it's, it's a great conference. I would highly, highly yeah, recommend that's it. Yeah. That's true. I <laughs> totally <laughs> second that. Yeah. All right, then, Ray, thanks a lot for sharing this. And Kay. yeah, everybody, thanks for watching. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cheers.